So we end up this course in a way similar to how we began. You may remember that at the very first lecture I talked about how viruses are probably beneficial in some ways. Today we're going to end up with talking about ways that we can take viruses and repurpose them uh, to help us out. Now, the kind of benefit I alluded to initially had to do with simple infection with, with natural viruses out there helping us. And we do have a little bit of evidence that this is the true, and I gave that to you in the first lecture. And I'm sure in coming years we'll have more evidence for that. But we have a lot of ways that we are repurposing viruses for our benefits. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And this has to do with viral gene therapy. This is a new lecture for this course. When we first started this class eight years ago, something like that, there wasn't enough information to do this. But now, as you will see, I hope you see, we have lots of very exciting ways that we can use viruses to help us. So viral gene therapy uses the vectors, the genomes of viruses, we call them viral vectors, in a number of different ways. The first is to do gene therapy, uh, which is to give a gene to someone who is missing the gene, has a mutation in it, that prevents that gene from expressing a functional gene product. So uh, that's gene therapy of sorts. Another way, of course, is to use virus vectors to deliver antigens. We've talked a little bit about this already, to make vaccines using uh, another virus. Viral oncotherapy is another way that we can use viral vectors to kill tumors, and we'll talk about uh, that as well today. And of course, throughout this course, I've been giving you examples of research uses of viral vectors, the way that we can manipulate the genome of a virus to take away genes, add new genes, to produce proteins for other reasons. Uh, to help us do our experiments. So we've been using uh, these techniques that you'll hear about today uh, in the laboratory for many years. So in general, using viral vectors has many, many benefits, and I want to touch upon each of these different categories today. All of this I'm going to tell you about today, for the most part, depends on being, to manip being able to manipulate the genome of a virus. And we could not do this before the early 1980s, when we had recombinant DNA technology developed to the point where we could take a viral genome, whether it be DNA or RNA, and clone that genome into a bacterial plasmid. And I'm showing you as an example uh, what was done with poliovirus. This was the first animal virus for which the genome was cloned and put in a plasmid and shown to be infectious in cells. So poliovirus, you may remember, is a virus with an RNA genome. The RNA is plus-stranded, shown here outside of the capsid. If you take that plus-stranded RNA genome and you put it into cells by transfection, it initiates an infectious cycle because it's a messenger RNA and it can be translated and all the proteins that are needed will be made. Using recombinant DNA, uh, a DNA copy of this RNA genome was made and then cloned into a bacterial plasmid. Now, probably you, all of you know that plasmids are circular DNAs in bacteria that will replicate uh, outside of the chromosomal DNA. It's very easy to introduce plasmids into bacteria. It's easy to grow up large quantities of DNAs, and then you can extract the DNAs and do what you wish with them. So you can take the uh, RNA of polio, make a DNA copy, clone it into a plasmid. And then what was found, uh, very importantly, is if you take this DNA and you introduce it into cells by transfection, these cultured cells will now make virus. That's because this DNA has in it a promoter. Uh, when the plasmid is put into cells, it's transcribed, gives rise to mRNA, which is then translated and then initiates an infectious cycle, very much like if you put RNA in. Except this is DNA, and DNA is terrific because you can manipulate it. You can cut out pieces and swap them out. You can make deletions, insertions. You can mutate uh, bases to change amino acids. You can do all of this stuff which you can't do with RNA, and this is part of what recombinant DNA 
uh, was all about figuring out ways to manipulate DNA genomes. So we have a way to change any viral genome into DNA, and then we have ways to change it. And that's the basis for viral vectorology, which I'm going to tell you about today. It's also the basis of virology today. All the work we do depends on uh, this kind of approach. All right, so you take a DNA copy of any virus, whether it be an RNA virus, plus or minus stranded, segmented, doesn't matter, DNA viruses, single stranded, double stranded, doesn't matter. You can take a clone copy of the DNA and recover virus from it. This is really important that you understand this. That's what makes all of this possible. Just having polio virus alone is not good enough to do the stuff I'm going to tell you about today. You have to be able to manipulate the genome, and to do that, you need recombinant DNA. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the viruses that are used as vectors for gene therapy, for oncolytic applications, and I want to give you a sense of some of the properties that are important, some of the negatives about some of these vectors. I'm not going to go through all of them, I just want to cover some to illustrate the principles. One of the main uh, viruses being used for gene therapy is adenovirus. Remember adenovirus, double-stranded DNA-containing uh, virus with an icosahedral capsid. It's got these interesting uh, fibers sticking out from each five-fold axis of symmetry, and those, of course, attach to the cell receptor. The DNA, about 40 kilobases of double-stranded double DNA, it's linear, encodes a variety of proteins. For our purposes, in including a DNA polymerase, and other accessory proteins. Here's the polymerase right here. The ends have an inverted terminal repeat, each of which contains an origin of replication. And at the left end, there is also a packaging sequence. You guys remember packaging sequences? They're needed on DNAs and RNAs to get them into the capsid. So this is another key to gene therapy. Beyond being able to manipulate the DNA, you need to be able to know where the packaging sequences are so that that will help you get whatever you want into the viral capsid. So we know where the packaging sequences uh, of adenovirus lie. So again, you have lots of viral proteins encoded by mRNAs that produce, are produced on both strands. Today we're going to actually use a lot of what we've talked about in this course, and you're going to see why I've told you certain things because really it comes down to this in, in some way, uh, using viruses to treat patients. Now, adenovirus vectors have a number of advantages, which are listed here. They're very good at infecting cells that have finished dividing, post-mitotic cells. Uh, pretty fast onset of gene expression, 48 hours. The virus DNA remains episomal. That means it doesn't integrate into the cell. So uh, there's minimal risk of insertional mutagenesis. So we'll see when we talk about retroviruses, which have an integration step in their life cycle, that insertional mutagenesis is a risk. Adenoviruses don't have those. Minimal, but I told you when we talked about transformation and oncogenesis, there is a, a very, very slight possibility that any DNA that gets in the nucleus will integrate. But this hasn't yet been seen with adenovirus vectors. You have a pretty big capacity, up to 37 KB, can accommodate most genes that you might want to give people. It's easy to make pure, high titer preparations of the virus. A lot of human serotypes um, and lots of animal serotypes. This is important because when you infect someone with a vector, you don't want their memory, their antiviral memory, to eliminate your vector in a couple of days, right? So you have to make sure the patient doesn't have immunity to the serotype, and you give them a serotype for which they don't have immunity. And if they have immunity to all the human serotypes, which is not likely, you pick an animal serotype, and you can do that as well. Lots of positives about this vector. A drawback is they're extremely immunogenic. Okay, so when you infect people with these vectors, very rapidly you get an innate and then an adaptive response. And as you will see, this has caused problems and has led to the modification uh, of these vectors. The first generation of adenovirus vectors uh, were, were deleted in the E1 region, and some of them had an E3 deletion. So at the bottom here is a schematic of the viral DNA. In blue, at the left ends and the right ends are the inverted terminal repeats. 
Uh, and at the left end is the size sequence, the packaging sequence. So in all the vectors, this ha these have to be present. The two ends and the psi are the minimum that you need to make a virus vector. So the first generation vectors were deleted uh, in E1. E1 encodes the T antigens. Remember, these are the viral proteins that antagonize RB and P53. RB and P53 are cell proteins that regulate the cell cycle, right? And adenovirus wants to kick the cells into dividing, so they're making DNA, and, the, and so the viral DNA replication apparatus can get going. So we take out the E1 region uh, of these vectors so that they will be defective. You can infect someone, they will express genes, but they will not replicate, and they won't make infectious viruses. All right, so this, this is a, a feature uh, of a lot of viruses where we want to use them to deliver genes. We don't necessarily want these viruses to replicate and spread to other people. We want them contained. So we put in debilitating mutations. E1 deletion makes a non-infectious adenovirus. Okay? If, you, uh, put, if you built a virus without E1, it could get into a cell. It would make uh, mRNAs, and your gene would be made, and that's what you want, but the virus would not replicate. The DNA would not replicate, right, because E1 is not, in, is not um, kicking the cell into the cell cycle because it can't antagonize RB and P53, and that gives you no infectious virus. So how do you make these vectors, you may ask? How do you grow up large preps? Well, we have cells that produce the E1 proteins. These have been made for years, cells in culture that are making these proteins constitutively all the proteins in the E1 region. What do you think is a property of those cells? Do you think they divide for 10 generations and then die? No, why not? Because they're the E1 proteins are antagonizing P53 and RB. It's, it's like it's, you made a transformed cell line. In fact, that's one way to make transformed cells, to put E1 in it. So we can make these vectors uh, by introducing DNA, deleted for E1, into a cell line that produces the E1 proteins. And you now will get out packaged adenovirus DNA in a particle that has um, no E1 region, and then you can stick your gene in wherever you want it. These early first-generation vectors also were, ha some of them had deletions in the E3 region, which is a small area down to the right end of the genome. Uh, this encodes a number of immunomodulatory proteins. Remember, antagonists of the MHC proteins and so forth. Um, so this was removed because um, the virus is not doing multi-cycle replication, and this would ep empty up some area to put more genes in. Because remember, these early vectors have most of the genome present, so the more space that could be made to stick a gene in, the better. Okay. Second generation vectors. So again, wild type genome. Uh, the first generation deleted in E1 and E3. Uh, the second generation, they deleted uh, a few other areas, parts of E2 and E4. Uh, these were regions that could be deleted and complemented in cell lines, basically to make more space for inserts, because uh, having just E1 and E3 deleted wasn't enough. All right, so that's second generation. Now we are working with third generation adenovirus vectors, where everything is deleted. No more genes. We call these gutless vectors. The only things we have are the two inverted terminal repeats, shown here in black, and the psi sequence on the left. No other, no genes, no viral genes are present. So you have the whole 30, almost the whole 37 KB to stick in foreign genes that you want to produce. So that's what the vector DNA looks like uh, on the top. You could put any kind of DNA in there. So in the early days when they were testing it, they would put a stuffer DNA in. And let's see exactly how this looks. So on the bottom is the wild type adenovirus DNA again. So the left end, we have the inverted terminal repeat. It's shown expanded above it. Uh, then the packaging sequences are shown next to it from about nucleotides 200 to 400 at the left end. You need those, otherwise the DNA will not be packaged in the particles. Uh, and then we have a promoter for uh, the early region, which normally would have 
been driving E1 mRNA synthesis, but we've taken out the E1 gene, and right, right next to the promoter is the right-handed inverted terminal repeat. So you would clone your insert just downstream of this promoter, uh, all right? And you would then take that DNA and you would put it into cells uh, that are producing E1, but you also need to co-infect these cells with a helper virus, all right? This helper is needed to provide the capsid proteins to package uh, this DNA. This helper virus needs to be disabled. Otherwise, it will be in your preparations a vector. And you don't want that. You don't want infectious virus present uh, that is going to be going from patient to patient. You just want one round of expression. So the helper virus is also E1 deleted. And then the helper serves to produce capsid proteins. The capsid proteins will package uh, your vector into which you've inserted your gene and then you can use that to infect people. Now let me give you another more, a little bit more information about this because you may be wondering why isn't the vector going to be present here. So this is another diagram of explaining how these third generation adenovirus vectors are, are used. At the top insert is the gutless vector, the adenovirus vector with no genes, just the two ITRs, the the psi sequence, the packaging sequence, we put our insert uh, just downstream of the promoter. And we, uh, ins we co-transfect that DNA into cells with uh, a, a helper DNA, which is shown here. This has the entire genome, except uh, around the packaging sequences, we have put what are called LOX P sites. Okay, and these actually were named after cream cheese and lox. Okay, the, um, the enzyme that recognizes these CRE sites, uh, these lox sites, is called CRE, cream cheese and lox. That's what, you know, scientists do have senses of humor, all right? And you can remember it that way. Now, in a, in the cell line that's used to produce these vectors, produce, uh, these cells are making E1, just like before, because this helper DNA is, is E1 deleted because you don't want it to be able to spread. To prevent it from packaging, uh, this packaging sequence is going to be removed in these cells. These cells also produce CRE, which is a recombinase that recognizes the LOX P sites and cuts them both. So when you insert this DNA, this helper DNA into these cells, the CRE recombinase that's constitutively produced will clip out the packaging sequence. The ends will be stuck together. So you will have some of this helper DNA packaged but it won't be infectious, sorry, it won't be packaged at all because there's no packaging sequences, right? All, the only thing you will have packaged is the vector DNA. And the capsids, again, the capsid proteins are provided by uh, the wild type helper DNA, and that cannot be packaged because its packaging sequence is removed uh, by these, these LOX P sites together with Cree, okay? So this is an incredible use of recombinant DNA trickery, plus all the things we've learned about viruses. We know packaging sequences. We've, the Cree lock system, by the way, does anyone know where this came from? Not from mice. Not from mice. Wrong kingdom. They're prokaryotic. Cree locks are prokaryotic enzymes, okay, that people discovered and had this enzyme in the site, and they decided, well, we could use this in eukaryotic cells. So they're used in mice to delete genes and so forth. And here they're used to delete the packaging sequence. All right, so that gives you now these large insert vectors. You can put a lot of up to 37 or 36 KB of gene in there. Uh, and these particles are not going to be infectious. They don't have any viral genes at all. There's no helper virus present. Kind of the perfect uh, vector. So nice, nice technology. But that's not enough. Ma making these vectors with big capacity wasn't enough over the years. We've realized that you get immune responses against these vectors uh, and a variety of other issues. So modifications have been introduced, again, which take advantage of our understanding of the biology of these viruses to try and change their properties. And there are three different modifications shown on this. So one of the issues is uh, that you get an immune response against the vector even if you use a, a serotype to which your patient has not been infected before, uh, you will get 
innate responses, eventually you will get adaptive responses that are going to limit the utility. So a variety of ways are, have been developed to modify the vectors with microvesicles. Those are the ones shown at the top. They're made of lipids uh, or various polymers. Those are shown in blue, which will basically shield the particle. So these particles are shielded with these compounds. They're not recognized by antibodies, so they have a, a greater chance of, of expressing their genes. Sometimes you want to target your vectors to specific cells. Now, adenoviruses have tropism for respiratory cells. Some of them have a tropism for enteric cells. Sometimes you'd like to change that, and this is possible. So you can modify the virus with various peptides or natural ligands and target them to different receptors. So for example, here, fibroblast growth factor 2. This is a ligand. We know its receptor is on certain kinds of cells. You can attach FGF2 to the viral capsid and now have it bind cells that express the FGF2 receptor and they get, the viruses get taken up into them. So you can leverage our understanding of virus entry and change the tropism uh, of the virus. You can also do this by changing the fiber. The fiber, remember, is the protein that attaches to cell receptors. You can insert peptides into the fiber. You can make chimeric fibers with different serotypes, even human-animal uh, serotypes. You can combine uh, the, the, the knob with a different fiber. You can even make chimeric uh, knobs and so forth. So you can, this is another way to change the receptors to which the adenoviruses bind to change the tropism. So, I'm just giving you an overview of what can be done, but there have been many studies that take advantage of being able to change uh, the virus in this way. And again, this depends on our understanding of the structure of the fiber. You know, we just can't put sequences anywhere. We have to put them in a place where we know it's not going to disrupt it and so forth. So really exciting stuff. So that's adenovirus. It's a major vector. And I'll give you some examples in a moment of, of how we use that. Another important vector is adenovirus-associated virus, AAV. We've talked about this. This is a parvovirus. These are rather small uh, icosahedral particles with single-stranded DNA genomes. And the genome is shown in blue. And we talked about how this replicates. This has funny terminal repeats that form these uh, T structures at either end, uh, which are important for self-priming uh, during DNA synthesis. Uh, these viruses have two main coding regions. They have a rep region, a rep open reading frame, which uh, encodes a couple of proteins that are needed so that the viral DNA is recognized by the cellular DNA replication machinery. These viruses do not encode a DNA polymerase. The only thing they do is encode these rep proteins, which will draw the cellular machinery uh, to the viral genome. On the right, the second open reading frame encodes the capsid proteins, which build the, the small icosahedral capsid. So relatively simple genome, replication proteins and capsid proteins. And these have been really important for certain kinds of uh, gene therapy. Some of the advantages of adeno-associated viruses include you get very long-term gene expression uh, when you infect people. These viruses do not integrate into the genome, they remain episomal. And for, for reasons that we don't understand, they infect the cell and the episomes remain there. As long as the cell is living, the episomes remain. So you have very, very long-term durable gene expression. There are also multiple serotypes of these viruses available. So again, if someone has uh, immunity to a particular serotype, you can change. And there are ways to change that as well, as I'll tell you. The way you... Um, make vectors with AAV is based on the fact that these viruses cannot replicate. Many of these viruses, the ones that are used for gene therapy, they can't replicate except in cells that are co-infected with adenovirus. So these are helper-dependent viruses. So what you do is, here's, here's a map of the viral genome in part A. So you have inter inverted terminal repeats at the ends. These are essential for DNA replication, so you have to keep those. Uh, then we have the rep and the cap genes. To make vectors, we delete the genes of the virus. And even at that, we don't have a lot of uh, coding capacity. We don't have a lot of space for transgenes, about 5 kb or so. 
but you get rid of all the viral proteins, you leave uh, a promoter at the left end, shown in yellow, and at the right end you leave a polyadenylation signal, and then you put your transgene in there. You then take that DNA shown in part B, you transfect it into cells and in culture, along with another plasmid or the same plasmid uh, containing adenovirus helper functions, and specifically you need the E1, the E2, E4, and the VA genes from adenovirus. So you don't need the whole virus, you don't need adenovirus capsid proteins, you just need uh, certain gene products to get the host cell dividing uh, and to inhibit uh, phosphorylation of EIF2. That's on one plasmid. The second plasmid, you have the rep and the cap genes, which are needed, but they don't have to be on the same plasmid as your vector. So the cap, of course, will get your transgene packaged in an adeno-associated virus DNA. So you take minim three plasmids minimum, transgene plasmid, the rep cap plasmid, and then a plasmid with these adenovirus genes on them. You put them into cells, and out comes recombinant adenovirus, uh, adeno-associated virus, AAV. You don't make adenoviruses because you don't have the whole genome. You don't have adenovirus capsids, just helper functions. Um, and you don't make wild-type adeno-associated virus because you don't have a plasmid that encodes the viral genome. You just have a plasmid encoding the transgene. The ITRs make sure that this is the only DNA that is replicated in cells. <clears throat> now let's say you want to change the tropism of adeno-associated virus. Uh, there are many serotypes that you can use in, if you want to say, uh, deal with immunity issues, but if you want to change the tropism, this is an approach that's been done, which is very clever. You take um, cap capsid genes from different adenovirus serotypes, and there's just a bunch of them shown here. Um, and you can do a variety of manipulations with those genes. You can subject them to random mutagenesis, so changing randomly DNA throughout to change the capsid sequence. You can shuffle the various pieces of the capsids, so you get chimeric plasmids shown here in the different colors. You can do peptide insertions throughout the capsid region as well, which is shown here. And you take uh, all of these DNAs and you throw them into cells uh, with adeno-associated virus genomes and you get viruses of various sorts out. So this is going to be a whole mixture of all sorts of viruses with different kinds of capsids and insertions. And then you select for what you want. If you want a virus that will replicate in mouse tissues, you take this output and pass it through a mouse. You take what comes out and you look at that. Maybe you want a virus that's well adapted to the respiratory epithelium. You take respiratory epithelial cells, you put them in culture, you infect with this mixture of adenovirus, and you take what comes out. Maybe you want to make sure that uh, this adenovirus can bind a specific ligand. All right, so you can make a column with your ligand on it. You can pass your adenoviruses through the column uh, and elute what sticks. So there are many different ways you can select from this original mutagenized population, you now have a smaller population of AAVs, and you can go through this whole process again many times until you get the vector you want. So people do this all the time because there's a big need to have good vectors for gene therapy. Uh, they have to be able to target different tissues and be resistant to immunity. So this sort of shuffling you can do with adenoviruses as well. All right, another vector, a very important vector for gene therapy is retrovirus vectors. The retroviruses are RNA-containing viruses. They're enveloped. Uh, they have a DNA intermediate in their replication cycle. Uh, these virus particles encode reverse transcriptase, so the RNA, when it inf comes into a cell, is converted to DNA, and then the DNA integrates into the host cell genome, and from there, mRNAs are made and all the proteins are made to make new virus particles. Two different kinds of retroviruses are used for gene therapy applications. On the left, retroviruses uh, with simple genomes. For example, avian leukosis virus, the very first uh, viruses discovered in, in chickens in the early 1900s. Uh, murine leukemia viruses, all these viruses that were used to figure out the basis for retrovirus-mediated uh, oncogenesis transformation, they have simple genomes. They consist of uh, two LTRs, with a gag, a polymerase, and an envelope gene. So the gag encodes the structural 
proteins to make the capsid. The Paul includes reverse transcriptase and integrase, and envelope includes the glycoproteins that are in the membrane of the virus. The viruses with complex genomes, retroviruses with complex genomes like HIV, they have gag, pol, and envelope, but they also have many other accessory proteins like VIF and REV and VPR, VPU, TAT, et cetera. We've talked about some of these proteins and what they do uh, throughout this course. Both of these uh, retroviruses have been used for viral vector and gene therapy. Now, so the, the vectors are based either on a HIV, these are called lentivirus vectors because HIV is a lentivirus, or other retroviruses. I'll show you examples uh, of both. They, one of the restrictions to using HIV is that these vectors can only, uh, can infect non-dividing cells. So the other retroviruses, the ALVs, the MLVs, they will only infect dividing cells when the nuclear membrane is broken down, that's the only time they can get their proviral DNA into the nucleus. Uh, HIV can infect all kinds of cells, doesn't have this limitation. So that's an advantage of, of HIV. Of course, all these retrovirus vectors have the advantage of long-term expression. As long as the virus doesn't kill the cell, and we can do things to manage that, the DNA will integrate, right? It's proviral, it's integrated into the host cell DNA, and that's going to be expressed long time. You can get moderately sized inserts up to 8 kb. However, the fact that these DNAs do integrate means they have the potential to cause insertional mutagenesis. For example, the provirus, remember there are two LTRs in the provirus. Both LTRs are the same. They both have a promoter. The right-hand LTR, if it sits down next to an oncogene, it can turn on the oncogene and transform the cell. And this is not good because these viral DNAs integrate randomly. So at a certain fraction of the time, if you give these to people, you're going to get uh, integration. So the, the solution to this has been to inactivate the, the promoter in the three prime LTR. So that's, that problem is, is greatly re reduced. Or you can make them uh, integration deficient, in which case you won't get long-term expression, but you won't get transformation either. Another feature of these viruses is that you can pseudotype them. So pseudotyping simply means you take the glycoprotein uh, of the retrovirus and you substitute it with another viral glycoprotein. And the one that's been used in these vectors most of the time is the glycoprotein from VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, related to rabies, uh, shown here. You can take the gene encoding that and make retroviruses with that instead of the retroviral uh, envelope. This is called pseudotyping. And the reason this is good is because VSV has a very broad tropism, right? What's the tropism of HIV glycoprotein? CD4 cells, right? So not every cell is going to have that. So if, if that's not the target that you want, you pseudotype them and this uh, pseudotype retrovirus will, will infect many different cells. <clears throat> so here's how you make these vectors. You take the viral genome and you can split it into two plasmids. Uh, on the top, you have a plasmid with just DNA encoding the capsid genes. Okay? So this would be GAG. You can put Paul in here if you want. And then you have another plasmid that encodes the envelope. These both have a promoter on the left side that's shown by the yellow. You have to have a polyadenylation sequence. If you take just these two uh, plasmids, transfect them into cells, what you will get are empty particles without viral genomes in them. You've given these cells uh, everything they need to build particles, to build the capsid, to cause budding, to acquire uh, an envelope via the, the escort pathway, to put glycoproteins in the envelope, but there's no genome because you haven't put a genome in here. All you've done is put coding sequences for a variety of viral proteins. This, these empty viruses do have reverse transcriptase uh, and integrase and protease because you've included those in the gag Paul plasmid. So now how do you get a gene into these? You put a third plasmid into this transfection. So you've got your capsid plasmid. You've got your envelope plasmid, and if you want, you can use VSVG here instead of the retroviral envelope to get broad tropism. And then the third plasmid encodes your gene. 
So you got a gene here in pink with a promoter uh, and, a, and a polyadenylation signal. When you transfect these three into cells, you will get out retroviruses with your foreign gene in it. What else needs to be in this third plasmid to make sure it gets into the retrovirus particles? You need a packaging sequence, the size sequence, which we know uh, is at the left end of the retrovirus genome. You make sure this plasmid has the packaging sequence. The mRNA that will be made has to have that packaging sequence, and that will direct it uh, into the virus particle. So you see how knowing the biology of viral reproduction allows you to make vectors like this. Uh, another virus that's used, vaccinia virus. It's a big DNA-containing virus with a very large genome. And we have vaccines that are derived from vaccinia virus that we used to use to immunize against smallpox. So vaccinia is an attenuated infectious virus, vaccine virus. Uh, the genome, has, the virus has been passaged in a variety of different cells, so there are lots of mutations and deletions of various sorts in the genome. And so the virus is replication deficient as we made it as a vaccine. Uh, it, it will grow in avian cells, but not in mammalian cells. There's an assembly block, so the vaccine is produced in avian cells. You are inoculated with it. Uh, it will do very limited replication. It will express some proteins. Uh, and it immunizes you against smallpox. This is the virus that's used as a vector because it's quite safe. We've had many years of experience working with it. It can be worked at under BSL-1 conditions, the very lowest level of biological containment. Remember, BSL-4 is the highest. It's an intrinsic adjuvant. It has lots of protein and nucleic acid. It induces inflammation, so you get a very nice uh, immune response if you need to make a vaccine, for example. And it has a huge capacity, double-stranded uh, DNA, uh, hundreds, of, uh, base, th hundreds of thousands of base pairs in length of double-stranded DNA. The way you make vectors with vaccinia is you take, a, you take your gene, which is shown in red on the left, and we've cloned it into a plasmid vector. And this vector is called the shuttle vector because it has sequences, in addition to the fact that it's a bacterial plasmid, so you can grow it up in bacteria. It has sequences on either end of the transgene, which are derived from the vaccinia virus. And so when you take this plasmid and transfect it into cells that have been infected with uh, this vaccine strain, MVA, the plasmid DNA will recombine at a certain frequency into the viral genome. And so you simply have to be able to identify those recombinant viruses, which is not too difficult. Uh, and then you have recombinant vaccinia with your gene of choice, and you can then use that for whatever the gene therapy application is. Okay, so that's a, a summary of some of the most used uh, vectors for gene therapy. This is just a table which has some of the advantages and disadvantages. You can see, you know, the capacity is different among these, these vectors. The tropism is different. Um, some of them have... Um, stable expression, uh, as we've talked about. Um, some of them do persist in transduced cells. Um, the, some disadvantages include low titers, the oncogenic potential of the retroviruses, um, the adeno-associated viruses, the immunogenicity, as well as the adenoviruses. This is a, pa a problem. The AAVs have low capacity and so forth. Uh, interesting problem with the adenovirus. So adenoviruses, if you just inject them intravenously, they will target the liver. Uh, and that can be good if that's where you want your gene to be produced. But if you don't, then that can be a negative. But as I said, these are a few of the, of the most used ones. There are others as well. But the principles I've talked to you about, the way you modify and change these vectors for, for your expression are, are all the same. So let's talk about some of the uses now of these vectors. This is a two interesting pie charts. Uh, the top one shows uh, some of the indications for gene therapy. What are the pathogenic conditions or disease conditions for which we're using gene therapy to treat patients? And the big yellow part here is cancer. So these are all ongoing clinical trials or clinical trials that have been completed with vectors of various sorts. Most of them, 64%, 1,300, have been to treat cancer. The second biggest one uh, comprises monogenic diseases, def defects in one gene. We'll talk about that 
in the moment. Uh, then we have infectious diseases, so these would be vaccines. Uh, we have cardiovascular diseases and then a variety of other ones, including ocular diseases, which we'll talk about. So you can see what the big pushes are here. So again, these are trials using uh, vectors for gene therapy. Now on the bottom are the different kinds of vectors that are used in these trials. And you can see the big ones are adenoviruses in yellow and retroviruses in blue. Uh, a lot of trials actually involve naked DNA, so we're, we're not going to talk about it because that's not viral delivered, but you can give people uh, DNA for a variety of indications. Vaccinia viruses in purple, adeno-associated virus, uh, then we have lentiviruses in gray, more pox viruses there, herpes simplex in green, and then other vectors. So adeno and retroviruses uh, and AAV are the big ones. Now when you want to um, do gene therapy, you can have two general approaches to delivering the therapeutic effect. And they're shown on this slide. So we have a human that needs some kind of therapy, whether it be a vaccine, uh, or um, replacement of a gene, or oncotherapy. One, way, one approach is you can make your vector with the gene in it in ways that we've just talked about, and you can inject this into the patient. So if this were a vaccine, you could do an intramuscular injection, and the vector would stay restricted to the muscle for the most part and give you a nice immune response. Uh, if you're treating tumors, sometimes you want to inject the virus right into the tumor. We'll talk about some examples of that. Sometimes they're given intravenously. If you have disseminated metastases, you can't really inject. So you hope that intravenous injection will have the virus reach everywhere. But in general, in intravenous inoculation is not a great approach because the virus is going to go through the liver right away and it's going to get cleared very quickly and you're going to get a robust immune response. Anyway, you have various approaches where you simply put the virus uh, in the patient um, and, you know, depending on your application, and I'll give you some examples that, that can work. The other approach is if you want to correct a defect in a certain tissue, often you can't get the vector to that tissue very efficiently, so you take cells out of the patient and put the vector in them and then return them. So here we're taking stem cells uh, from the adult used to be that you would want to get bone marrow stem cells, but now you can actually purify stem cells from the blood. It's much easier, less painful, less invasive, and so forth. You can put these in culture for a short period of time and then uh, infect them with your viral vector that you have made. Uh, the vector will propagate the cells. You can check to make sure if, if the protein is being made, and then you can infuse them back into the patient. And because they're stem cells, they will give rise to many other cell types. And depending on where, where you've gotten them and how you differentiate them, uh, they, they can give rise to, to different sorts of cells. Uh, another approach, instead of taking stem cells from the adult, uh, there, are, there are banked embryonic stem cell lines that can be used. Uh, again, you can make ES cells, embryonic stem cells from these. You can put them in culture and infect them with your virus and return them. The other approach which was done previously would be to find a donor who is compatible with this individual, uh, and that donor would have the wild type gene, you don't have to do viral ther gene therapy, and just put those cells into this individual. This is very difficult, you often have to irradiate the recipient and destroy all the bone marrow cells. So viral gene therapy has really changed a lot in, in the sense that uh, you don't need to find a donor, you can use uh, the individual's own cells. Okay, so two general approaches, you either put the virus right in the person, or you take cells out, infect them, and then put them back in. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about using uh, virus vectors as vaccines. I just want to go through them briefly again. Uh, this is immunoprophylaxis against AIDS using an adeno-associated virus vector. And this adenovirus vector, AAV vector, has been cloned the genes for the heavy and the light chains of an antibody molecule against HIV that is broadly neutralizing. All right, so this is put in this vector using the approaches we just discussed. You have the two ITRs here. You would put this in a packaging cell line, make virus particles. And in this experiment, they're used to infect humanized mice. These are mice that have a human immune system, so you can give them HIV and the virus will replicate in, in the human immune system. Uh, and these mice are quite resistant to HIV infected. Again, they're making a lot of antibody molecules 
in their blood. They're making milligrams of this specific antibody in their blood. And when you challenge them many times, that's the red. The animals who receive the antibody gene is in, are in red. They are resistant to HIV. This is HIV replication on the Y. And the animals who receive the control inoculation are all infected. All right, so this gives very long-term protection at high levels. So this is now going into human clinical trials uh, as AIDS immunoprophylaxis. Uh, the other example of a vectored vaccine we talked about is taking the glycoprotein of Ebola virus, taking just that gene and inserting it into an adenovirus vector using the technology we've talked about. And uh, I showed you this last time, this challenge result. So these are non-human primates that have been vaccinated with the adenovirus vectors and then challenged intramuscularly with uh, Ebola virus, wild-type Ebola virus. This is done in a BSL-4 facility. And here we're using actually two kinds of vectors. We've talked about both, the adenovirus, and we're using a chimpanzee adenovirus because people don't have antibodies to chimpanzee adenoviruses. And we're also using uh, the vaccinia virus that I told you about, modified vaccinia Ankara, uh, as a boost. So the most effective protection, four out of four animals, uh, protected. Again, this causes lethal disease in these animals. When, when you gave a dose of the chimp adenovectored glycoprotein followed by a dose of the vaccinia vectored glycoprotein. Two different viruses, apparently the combination gives you very good immunity. So this again is also going uh, into clinical trials in people. Uh, the other vaccine we talked about again is against Ebola virus. This is one where we're using vesicular stomatitis virus as a vector. I didn't include this in my discussion, but the principles are similar. Uh, here's the genome of VSV. It's a negative strand RNA encoding for five different proteins. And what's done is we have a DNA copy of this VSV genome. We replace the viral glycoprotein of VSV with the glycoprotein of Ebola virus. So now we have a VSV uh, expressing the glycoprotein of Ebola. The way that's done, we have a plasmid shown on the left here, which encodes the entire VSV genome with the uh, N, M, P glycoprotein and L proteins. And we replace the VSV uh, glycoprotein gene with that encoding the various Ebola virus strains. Uh, and then we put that into cells by transfection. We also transfect plasmids that encode uh, three proteins that are needed for virus replication of VSV, the N, the P, and the L protein. So the L is the polymerase, and the other two are accessory proteins. So the, what this does is that the RNA, the genome RNA is made from this first plasmid. It is then replicated and encapsidated and eventually buds out uh, from proteins encoded within it, as well as these helper plasmids. So the result is it would look like VSV, but it has the Ebola like a protein. And of course, it's safe to work with this under BSL-2 conditions. Uh, and this has also been protective in non-human primates. Uh, these are animals challenged uh, uh, intranasally after 28 days after being vaccinated with this VSV recombinant. And you can see they're all surviving compared to the controls. Finally, I just want to mention one other vector. And we talked about this in the AIDS lecture. These are cytomegalovirus vectors. We talked about cytomegalovirus during persistent when we talked about persistent infections. We all get infected with CMV at a young age and the virus stays with us forever. So why not take advantage of that? And this is an example where a rhesus monkey cytomegalovirus has been modified to include um, the HIV glycoprotein. And uh, animals were immunized with this, rhesus macaques were immunized. Uh, and many of the animals uh, who were immunized, those are shown in various colors here at the bottom, these were protected against infection. We're looking at plasma viral load. And in blue are the animals that uh, received the control immunization. So these animals have a very long-term protection. They were challenged multiply, multiple times uh, during this year, and they remained, um, they remained resistant. So the hope is that if we can modify CMV to make it not cause disease in, in humans, then we could also use it as a vector. But it's not yet at that point. Let's talk a little bit about treating monogenic diseases with gene therapy. Uh, this is where we have a mutation in one gene. There are over 6,000 different monogenic diseases. One of 200 live births, the kid has one of these diseases, so they're quite frequent. They're perfect for gene 
uh, viral gene therapy, replace the defective gene, and we have about 1,800 uh, clinical trials on these done so far, either completed or in process. These are some of the diseases. There are 6,000 of them, so I don't want to show you uh, all of them, of course. Just to show you the principle, severe combined immunodeficiency, you can have a, a defect in one of two different genes. Uh, here's the incidence to show you um, how frequently this happens. Uh, these are being uh, treated with retrovirus vectors. They're in clinical trial, lipoprotein lipase, again, uh, AAV vectors, hemophilia, where you lack factor IX, AAV vectors, uh, hemoglobinopathies and thalassemias, which are caused by defects in alpha or beta globin genes. Uh, these are being treated with lentiviruses, alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, with adeno-associated viruses. Uh, and then some retinal degenerative diseases. I'm going to talk about this uh, in particular, uh, where we have defects in the retina, and, and these are being treated with AAV vectors. X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy is, is caused by a defect in a transporter protein. Lentivirus treatment and Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. Uh, is being treated by Lenti. So let's go through a couple of these and see how they work. First gene therapy done in people was 1993. Uh, this was on a 23-year-old male who had cystic fibrosis. And these individuals have mutations in the cystic fibrosis transporter gene. It is a membrane protein that's important for transporting solutes across the membrane. And they, dispel, they develop respiratory issues. So you want to focus gene therapy on the respiratory Epithelium. This young man was given 2 times 10 to the 8 PFU of an early version adenovirus E1, E3, deleted with the CFTR DNA in it. He was given, it was inserted in, deep into his lung by fiber optic bronchoscopy. It was sprayed in, and it's, that's the procedure being done right here. Uh, and pre-therapy, these are biopsies from his lung, his deep lung cells, you see. Uh, no production of the C C T CFTR gene. And on the right, four days after uh, this virus was sprayed into his lung, these cells are stained with an antibody to the CFTR protein. You can see they're producing it. Uh, and this was then repeated in a number of other individuals, and the results are shown on the right here. So this is on the y-axis, we're looking at the ratio of exogenous to endogenous protein. So these individuals make low levels of often defective protein. And 5%, which is what this dotted line in, this is the level considered therapeutically successful. If you can get 5% transduction or better, you will have uh, gone a, a good way towards helping these individuals with their condition. So the first time they get uh, the adenovirus in the lung, you can see you, you all exceed 5%. These different colors are different patients. Second time, fewer individuals respond. The third time, nobody responds. So you do three separate infusions with the ad vector. By the third time, you have so much immunity that you no longer have any therapeutic value. So we learned a lot from these early studies, and in part, this is why we modified a lot of these vectors. So now we can actually do this more effectively. But it took many years to figure out uh, how to do that. Again, this, this clearance, the reason why it doesn't work the third time is because of the immune response. We didn't realize it was so robust, and we hadn't changed the serotypes at this early stage. We learned that from uh, these trials. Uh, this is a very famous case of human gene therapy, which some of you may have heard of. Jesse Gelsinger was an 18-year-old boy who had a disease called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. This is usually lethal at birth, but he had acquired a mutation in the gene in his early in life, so he could be treated with uh, the proper diet, but he, was, he entered himself in a trial which would have been used to make vectors for babies who would otherwise die early on if they, if they didn't get gene therapy. So he was given an adenovirus vector with the normal OTC gene. This was done at UPenn. Four days after he was given this, this was inoculated IV, uh, he died. He had massive immune responses and multiple organ failure. And we now know why this happened. There's a, there are very many accounts of this trial online. I, I encourage you to look them up if you're interested. Essentially, Penn broke a lot of rules uh, in this gene therapy trial. They shouldn't have used him as a patient. They did a lot of things that were not indicated. But this really set back the whole field for many years, and we made lots of changes to the way uh, these are done now. Uh, an example of a treatment that uh, worked but led to a problem. Uh, these were some babies who were being treated for X-linked severe combined immune deficiency. This is a uh, mutation in the IL-2 receptor gamma chain. So you become 
uh, immunosuppressed essentially and you get other infections. So these kids were given um, a retrovirus, a, a non-HIV retrovirus uh, containing the wild type gene and what was done was their bone marrow was removed, CD34 positive bone marrow. These are hematopoietic precursor cells. They were removed, transduced with the vector and then put back in the patients. Uh, four out of nine infants in Paris and one in London uh, developed T-cell leukemia years after the initial treatment. So these nine individuals, the treatment worked. It actually restored their immune system to a certain extent, um, but they got leukemia a couple of years later. And the reason is that the vector integrated next to an oncogene. So remember, one of the mechanisms of transformation is that a, a retrovirus can sit down next to an oncogene and activate its transcription. The oncogene makes the cells keep dividing and eventually they accumulate mutations and turn into tumors. Uh, as a consequence of this experience, there, there were at the time 27 different trials with retroviral vectors in progress. They were all halted for a number of years until people figured out how to modify the vector so it would no longer integrate. This is another example uh, of successful therapy, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy which is a defect in a transporter. Uh, these are kids who have severe neurologic disease, and they were previously treated uh, with allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation. So you find a, a compatible donor, you take bone marrow from them, and then transplant it into the recipients. And what happens is uh, some of these cells uh, migrate into the brain, and they make the protein that's needed. So instead of doing that, what they did in this study was to take the patient's own bone marrow and they derived stem cells from it and then infected it with a retrovirus uh, with a normal transporter. Here where they're using uh, lentiviruses. So again, the lentiviruses will integrate, make the transporter. You reinfuse these back into the patient. You, have to, you don't have to do a standard uh, bone marrow transplant. And in both of these individuals, there was a positive effect. Their neurological status either stabilized or improved. So this is an example, of course, of removing cells and treating them and then reinfusing them. So we've seen now both examples of that approach. Uh, an area where there's been a lot of success is in treating these inherited retinopathies. These are very common but untreatable blinding conditions. They're monogenic and they usually involve mutations in the retinal photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. So uh, here's on the bottom center a schematic of the retina with the retinal pigment in epithelium in, in green, and then a variety of other cells that are involved in uh, vision acquisition, the rods and cones and other cells, and the, and the ganglia. And these retinopathies can have a variety of different defects. And you can see here on the right how many different trials have been done to figure out which vectors work in different types of cells. So again, each disease is characterized by a, different, uh, a defect in a gene that's produced in a different cell type. So you want to be in the right place. So adeno-associated vectors, uh, lentiviral vectors, adenovirus vectors have been used to try and target uh, all of these different uh, cell types. And the way these are treated is the virus is injected into the retina. So a needle is placed through uh, the eyeball right into the retina. As you can see here, the virus is infected there. It replicates and there's been some good success uh, using this. For one of these retinopathies called Liber congenital amaurosis, uh, this is about one in 80,000 of the retinopathies, uh, this involves mutations in this gene, RPE65, which encodes a retinal protein present in those outer retinal pigment cells that's needed for photoreception. In dogs, uh, and a dog model for this blindness, a single subretinal injection of AAV with the wild-type gene restored uh, visual function, and this has now been in both phase one and two trials, has been safe, and it leads to uh, visual recovery in a number of these individuals lasting at least a year and a half. So again, the virus is put right into the retina. The protein is produced from the virus vector, and it's apparently uh, able to restore vision. I think this will be among the first uh, viral gene therapies that's going to be licensed in the next five years or so. So these are some of the gene therapy successes. SCID, adenosine deaminase, the Liber, as I've just told you, hemophilia, beta thalassemia, and lipoprotein lipase. All of these have been shown in clinical trials to be effective, and eventually uh, they will get licensed. But again, it's always a trial and error. You learn things, you modify the vector, and you go back until you have uh, the right product. Uh, the last topic I want to talk about is viral oncotherapy, destroying uh, tumors 
using viruses. And we have two general approaches here. Sometimes you take an animal virus, which you've just fortuitously learned, um, doesn't usually infect people, but will replicate and kill tumors. So this is kind of serendipity. I'll talk about myxoma virus and Seneca Valley virus. The more frequent approach is to take a human virus and modify it in some way so it's not going to cause disease in people, uh, modify it to specifically uh, infect the tumor. And in many cases, we add genes to immune enhance the tumor killing. And I'll show you what all of this means. So we have to do things to target these viruses to tumors, whether it be uh, measles virus, uh, herpes viruses, or adenoviruses. We can alter the HA of the measles, for example, so that it's now targeting markers on tumors. Uh, herpes simplex like a protein has been engineered to have uh, ligands that will bind specifically to tumors. So IL-13 is known to be overproduced on certain tumors, uh, and you can use antibodies against growth factors that are on tumors as well. Uh, adenoviruses, again, you can insert domains that, that will recognize the tumor antigen. You can put that in the fiber. You can put that into uh, proteins like this one, the hexon interlacing protein that's part of the capsid itself. So there are many ways that you can target tumor cells, and this whole field benefits from us studying tumor cells in detailed ways that we couldn't do before. We know the proteome, the, the, the uh, RNA, the, the RNA uh, transcriptome of tumor cells, so we can know exactly what is produced and tailor viruses to, excuse me, to recognize uh, those tumors. We can also do post-entry targeting. So the approaches I just showed you is modify the virus so it only attaches to tumor cells. You can also do things so that the virus will only replicate in and kill tumor cells. So for example, you can, on the top, we have a promoter, which you know only works in tumor cells. We can find these. So if this virus, this is your gene therapy vector, uh, gets into a healthy cell, the promoter doesn't work, virus will not replicate. In a tumor cell, the proteins needed for that promoter to be active are, are produced. You know, in tumor cells, lots of things are produced that are, that are not produced elsewhere, so you can take advantage of that to drive replication. Uh, another approach is really cool, involves the use of microRNAs. MicroRNAs are present in many normal tissues. You find some that are not produced in tumor cells, then you engineer the target for the microRNA into your vector genome. When that vector infects a normal cell, the virus replication will be halted because the microRNAs in that cell will degrade the viral genome, or the mRNAs. When the virus infects a tumor cell, that microRNA is gone, the virus will replicate. So this is how we make it specific for the virus. And on the right is simply a northern blot where we're looking <coughs> excuse me, at the expression of two <coughs> microRNAs in a variety of tissues. And you can see there are tissue-specific uh, patterns of expression. We also uh, like to arm viral vectors with certain proteins that will make them kill tumor cells and maybe the cells in the environment of the tumor cell. So the idea is that you can never infect every cell in a tumor. So can we do things so that neighboring uninfected cells are killed? Um, so that's called bystander killing. We do a couple of things. We put prodrug convertases in the vectors. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. We've got one example of putting an ion transport protein in the vector, and we can use uh, immunostimulatory factors. <clears throat> so let me give you some examples of these uh, viruses. First one is an example of an animal virus that doesn't infect humans, but does infect human tumors. This is myxoma virus, the same one that was brought into Australia. You may remember to kill the European rabbits, which had gone wild. Um, this doesn't replicate in any non-rabbit host. It doesn't replicate in normal human cells, but it does replicate in a variety of human cancer cells. And that's mainly because cancer cells in general don't make a good antiviral response. And in this particular case, um, these cells, of course, are transformed, so lots of pathways are activated, and apparently this virus requires some of those for replication. So the, the approach here is so far, this virus has just been studied in mouse models, where they will implant a human tumor uh, into a mouse, uh, and then 
either infect the mouse with myxoma virus or before implanting to infect the cells and culture and then implant them. And this virus has done really well, at least uh, in mice. These are different kinds of cancers here, um, leukemia, myeloma, pancreatic cancer, glioma, where you put them in various animals and they will grow as a tumor. So these are immunosuppressed mice, so the human tumors will grow. And this is the kind of tumor you get. And then the, the myxoma virus is either given before you infuse the tumor cells into the mouse or while the uh, tumor is in the mouse, uh, intra, uh, intraperitoneally or intratumorally, and you get very, very good outcomes. So if you infect these tumor cells in culture, they are much less able to uh, sustain a tumor in the animal. And if you have animals with tumors and infect them with myxoma, uh, it kills the tumor. So the idea will be either to inject this in people intratumorally or even to take out <clears throat> say bone marrow, so if you have someone with a leukemia, you could take out uh, bone marrow cells, infect them in culture with this virus, kill all the cancer cells, irradiate the host, and then recolonize with these cleaned up bone marrow cells. So in the next few years, this will go into clinical trials. And the Seneca Valley virus is another example of an animal virus. It was fortuitously discovered as a contaminant in serum. It's probably a pig or a cow virus in nature but it doesn't replicate uh, in human cells unless they're tumors. It replicates in certain kinds of cancers, as you can see here. In mice, again, implanted with these tumors, you inject the virus into them, it wipes out uh, these tumors, and this is now in a phase two trial where the virus is being intravenously inoculated, uh, and again, in individuals with a variety of tumors. So this, depending on the results, this may go forward uh, as well. So again, this doesn't replicate just by chance in normal human cells, only in tumor cells. So this is one approach to uh, doing this kind of oncotherapy. Uh, measles virus vaccine strain. <clears throat> so this is the virus used to vaccinate kids against measles. It turns out that this virus preferentially replicates in tumors. It has mutations in it that prevent it from antagonizing uh, immune proteins. So what they have done is add to this genome a uh, gene for the human sodium iodide symporter. This is an iodide transporter protein. So what you can do is, after you give this virus to tumor patients, uh, you can give them gamma-emitting isotopes so that you can visualize where the virus is replicating because these isotopes will be transported into the tumor cells by this symporter. Or you can give them beta-emitting isotopes, and again, they'll be transported specifically uh, into the tumor cell, and it will kill them and not any other cell. So this is a very clever approach to focusing uh, the tumor therapy on the tumor. Uh, this was recently used to treat two patients who had multiple myeloma. Uh, this is a B-cell tumor that uh, can be, is typically uniformly fatal. They were given 10 to the 11th uh, particles of this measles virus uh, intravenously. One of them they both had market improvement. One of them had complete remission. Uh, these tumors are characterized by clonal plasma cells uh, in the bone marrow. So this is one patient on the left. Pre-treatment, you can see clonal plasma cells and normal plasma cells after treatment. Very few clonal plasma cells left. And patient two, the same result. Uh, one of the patients also had a, a, a frontal lobe plasma cytoma, which you can see here in this scan basically a, a large mass on the forehead. Uh, this is pre-treatment on top, and you can see after treatment it's gone. So she had complete remission. This was a very successful trial, which will clearly uh, be going further. There's a herpes virus that was just licensed, uh, or just re approved, uh, recommended for licensing. Uh, this is the full name, it's called TVEC. And this has, gene, has the gene for GMCSF. Uh, so when the virus infects the tumor, uh, the GMCSF is produced. The GMCSF recruits granulocytes and macrophages, which then uh, act against the tumor cells. And this virus has been modified in other ways to make it tumor uh, specific. Uh, this has just gone through a phase three trial for melanoma. It was injected right into the tumor. We had 16% response uh, in this. And in fact, it was just uh, the FDA panel just gave the approval for this on April 29th. Uh, they voted to. Uh, you know, approve this, uh, eventually the FDA will probably license it. So this may be the first uh, uh, viral oncotherapy licensed uh, in the U.S. Again, this is directly injected into melanomas. <clears throat> I have a little, I have a little uh, problem with this Forbes article. They call it a, her a modified herpes bug. 
please, if any of you ever write for Forbes or Wall Street Journal, don't ever call a virus a bug, okay? <laughs> uh, I'll write to you and complain. <laughs> Adenovirus, uh, is, this is a clever one. This is a virus armed with GMCSF. These preferentially replicate in RB deficient tumors. Remember, tumors are deficient in RB and P53, those cell cycle checkpoint proteins. Uh, I'm going to explain to you how this works in a moment. This has been up to phase three for bladder cancer, where it's injected right into the bladder and has shown good results. Um, this is the virus that's used here on the bottom. Here's the adenovirus genome. And what they did is they replaced the E1A promoter with, the, with an E2F promoter. And then they put the GMCSF gene uh, into the E3 site under the control of the E3 promoter. Now, if you remember from way back one, exam number one, I showed you this picture and I said, are any viral proteins required for transcription of the early region promoter? And the answer is no. This promoter, the early, immediate early promoter, can be recognized by host transcription proteins. So what they did is they replaced the promoter which is normally recognized by the host protein, by an E2F promoter, which is only available in cells where RB is gone. I'll show you this to remind you. Normally, the E2F proteins, which are needed for transcription here, are bound up by RB. And the T antigens made by these DNA viruses free up uh, are, uh, the, the E2F protein so it can participate in DNA synthesis. So they have made this E1A region dependent on the E2F promoter, which will only happen in cells that don't have RB, which are tumor cells. So it makes it tumor specific. It will not replicate in a normal cell. Once the E1A protein is made, it will then activate the GMCSF and um, will be produced. And that gives you an immunomodulatory effect. So this is brilliant. This uses all the stuff I taught you. You can go out and make your own vectors now because you know how this works. <clears throat> There's another adenovirus licensed in China for treating head and neck tumors. It's called Oncarine. And this one, the E1B protein is deleted. This is a protein that antagonizes P53. So this will only replicate in tumors that are deficient in P53, and many of them are. Remember, P53 would kick the cells into apoptosis if DNA replication, if viral DNA replication were occurring. So viral T antigens have to degrade. P53, and E1B 55K protein of adenovirus is the protein that does that. So they deleted this, so this virus will only replicate in cells that lack P53. So this is brilliant. Again, you make it specific uh, for the tumor. You take advantage of our understanding of these uh, tumor antagonists. Uh, just a couple more. This is a vaccinia virus uh, called JX594. It's made by a company called Generex named after Edward Jenner. It's got GMCSF. Uh, it's deleted in TK, this, which it needs for replication. And TK happens to be elevated in tumors. This was actually delivered uh, intravenously uh, for people with metastatic tumors where you can't inject the virus into the tumor. And they treated 23 different pa patients with a variety of advanced treatment refractory solid tumors of all different tissues, as you can see here. So it's given intravenously, and the idea or the hope is that it will reach the individual tumors. Uh, this virus has a GFP gene in it, so you can see it reaching tumor tissue. So these are normal and uh, cancerous tissues from patients, uh, either given PBS or this vaccinia virus. And you can see uh, this rectal cancer, this endometrial cancer, the colon cancer. It's only the cancer cells where the virus is replicating, not the normal cells. So this is quite specific. Uh, the virus replicated in about half of the patients, and they did see some uh, anti-tumor activity. So this is another promising one uh, that's going to go forward. Uh, Prodrug convertases are sort of like using thymidine kinase uh, and giving, uh, which will tr uh, take a drug, a prodrug, and phosphorylate it so that it can be a chain terminating inhibitor in virus infected cells. So sometimes they will put thymidine kinase in these viruses and then also treat with gancyclovir. In the tumor infected cell, it gets converted to tricyclovir triphosphate. Uh, other of these vectors have cytosine deaminase in them, converts 5 fluorocytosine to 5 fluorouracil. And in both cases, then these act as nucleoside analogs to stop DNA synthesis. And the idea is. The prodrug convertase is just made in the tumor cell. Uh, it's going to stop DNA synthesis in the tumor cell. 
and that will kill it. These drugs then leach out and kill the neighboring cells as well. Now, these drugs do have other toxicities because they will be taken up by normal cells, but they are focused on the tumor, and so that really uh, helps kill it. Uh, a retrovirus called TOCA-511 uh, is, a, is a, armed with cytosine deaminase for the same reason. It takes uh, uh, in, intratumoral intravenous uh, 5-FU and convert it to a chain terminator, and this is being treated, uh, checked for glioma. And finally, a poliovirus is being used to treat glial tumors. This is the Sabin vaccine strain with the iris of rhinovirus type 2. Uh, this substitution apparently makes the viruses attenuated, and this was recently uh, featured on a 60 Minutes episode. <clears throat> the last one I want to tell you is Reovirus, which is an unmodified virus, one of the first to be used, which is not pathogenic for people. So here we are taking advantage of the fact that a human virus is not pathogenic. It preferentially replicates in tumor cells where transformation pathways are activated. And this is in very advanced studies for uh, a variety of tumors. So basically, this shows you how important basic research is. All of this wouldn't have been possible without studying basic viral replication, packaging sequences, transformation, oncogenesis, combined, of course, uh, with clinical studies. And so uh, this just shows you this. We need a balance between basic research and transformational research, which is research aimed at uh, curing diseases. So that's it for our virology course. Here was day one. Some, some of you are missing, but um, it seems like a long time ago. Um, I just want to tell you a few more things. Please, there is a survey at CourseWorks if you could fill it out, and it helps us to improve the course. Finish the quizzes if you haven't done so this week. I will have office hours on Thursday uh, from 4 to 6 p.m., and most importantly, you now know more virology than 99.9% .9 of the world. Don't forget it. Take it with you. You know where to reach me. Follow me on Twitter. And another virology course is viral. Thank you very much. <laughs>